Uh, hello, everybody. It is wonderful and an honor to be here. My name is Cass Sunstein. I am a professor at Harvard Law School, and I've worked in the US government and worked with other governments in various places in the world. And my topic is one that many governments and many citizens are concerned about, which is social division and democracy and polarization. So in many nations, people are divided and they have a hard time talking to each other and working together. And I know that's true in Chile. It's certainly true in the United States, my own country. It's true all over Europe. And the question is, what are we gonna do about it? I'm going to spend part of my remarks talking about the nature of the problem, and then some of my, my remarks talking about the solution. So we're going to explore why exactly societies are divided. Why is this new word polarization all around us in various languages? And what can we do to overcome it and find paths forward that people can agree on, whether the issue involves health or COVID-19 or equality or anything else? How can we find paths forward that we can agree on? Um, my own interest in polarization, that's the word I'm going to focus on, arose from experiments from a few years ago where we were exploring how much people wanted to punish wrongdoing. And you can think of the wrongdoing as involving corruption or as involving uh, a, a, a corporation that is uh, uh, treating people badly. How much do people want to punish wrongdoing? In some of the experiments, we asked people, how much do they want to punish a company that came up with a cure for baldness that didn't work? It was a failed baldness cure. Now, I personally think that company should be punished very badly. I don't really. And most people don't think the company should be punished very badly. And that's the data. People as individuals think that's not good, but it's not so bad. In another experiment, we asked people how much they think companies should be punished if they produce exercise machines for older people, you know, things where people can run on a track indoors and the exercise machine breaks down and people get badly hurt. So you may have an old person, say 85 years old, who's on an exercise machine. It not only doesn't work, it breaks down and they get injured people thought that was bad and that company should be punished severely. Okay, in making those judgments, what we did was we asked a group of individuals for and what they thought, and then we used the average judgment to figure out what people thought. And we thought that the average would be a good predictor of what a group of people would do. But we weren't sure and we followed up that experiment by asking people to form groups, to act like real juries that deliberate together. And gosh, were we surprised. On the baldness cure, people weren't very outraged by what the company did. As groups, they weren't outraged at all. The group was more lenient than the average individual. With respect to the exercise machine, groups were much more outraged than individuals. So groups of people talking to one another became more lenient than they were as individuals and groups of people talking together became much more outraged as groups than they'd been as individuals. That's a clue about how polarization occurs. When people are talking to one another, they often end up more extreme. More extreme if they're thinking this wasn't very bad misconduct. More extreme if they're thinking this was pretty bad misconduct. Having learned that from seeing how people are outraged or not, I've embarked on a series of experiments basically about democracy. And the question is, if you get a group of people in Chile, in France, in Germany, in Afghanistan, in the United Kingdom, together to talk about political issues, what exactly happens. Here's what we learned. If you get a group of people to talk about climate change who aren't very worried about climate change, 
there's some diversity, let's say in the group, but on average, they're not very worried. After they talk to each other, they're not worried at all. They become more unified, more confident, and more extreme in their judgment that climate change just isn't a problem. By contrast, if you get a group of people who are quite concerned about climate change and ask them to talk together, after they talk even for 20 minutes, they end up thinking climate change is a horrible problem and we should have an international treaty today. People who are concerned about climate change become more concerned, more unified, and more confident after they talk with each other. What I just described, a little experiment about climate change, and we've done the same thing for a large number of issues, is happening all over every country every day as a result of either social media or just life. When people who tend to think something with respect to politics or the constitution or corruption, if they talk to each other, they end up thinking a more extreme version of what they thought before they started to talk. That's polarization. And in our own experiments, if people were a little to the political right and they talked with other people to the political right, they ended up very much to the political right. And if people were a little to the political left and they talked to each other, they ended up very much to the political left. In fact, the differences between the groups got much greater when people were in cocoons of like-minded types, which is to say a recipe for social division is if people are talking mostly to people who agree with them, or if people are listening mostly to people who agree with them. When we see sharp social divisions in Germany or in the United Kingdom or in Chile or in Argentina, it's often because of this dynamic where like-minded people who tend to agree with each other sort themselves into echo chambers or information cocoons in which they don't stay where they were. They end up more extreme and society ends up more divided. Okay, let's talk a little bit about why that happens. One reason is if you're, you're in a group of people who tend to think something about, let's say climate change or equality, that's the, where the group is headed. You're gonna hear a lot of arguments about why climate change is a serious problem or why inequality is bad. And you're not gonna hear many arguments the other way. As a result, you're gonna become more firm in your commitments just because of what you're hearing. And that happens every day. A separate point is most people on political issues have a degree of humility and modesty. They are not that sure. And so they end up moderate. But if you hear that someone thinks the same thing you do, you become a little more confident, a little less humble, and a little less moderate. So what is happening in countries all over the world is people are hearing people who agree with them. And then they think, I'm right, and they're wrong. And then they start saying louder and louder, I'm right, and they're wrong. And pretty soon, people on both sides are pretty angry with each other because they're hearing one another. This is a point about how moderation is overcome by agreement. And there's also a point about how people want to be seen in a good light by other members of the human race. And if you're in a group of people, all of whom have a certain political conviction, you will shift in their direction precisely because that's what they all tend to think. And pretty soon, if you wanna preserve your reputation and your sense that other people like you, you will be shifting in a more extreme position just to fit with others. I think with these little experiments, we know a lot now about why societies are divided. 
that groups of like-minded people, whatever the issue is, tend to clump together on Facebook, on Twitter, on some other social media outlet, or clump together in life, depending on geography, so that they are listening to and talking to people who agree with them. And pretty soon a society can get torn. In the worst cases, societies start to fall apart. In cases that are very challenging, though not so bad, countries have a hard time governing and something very large is uh, happening and it ha societies have to find a way to overcome it. Okay, I've told you about group polarization. Now I'm gonna tell you something very closely related that has to do with how information travels. And to explain that, I'm going to tell you about another experiment. It doesn't involve politics initially, but I hope you'll see it has everything to do with politics. The experiment involved music and popular songs. People would go on a website and they'd decide whether they wanted to download a song after listening to it for a few seconds. So they could see, is this the song they like? In that experiment, you could see whether a large population, thousands of people liked or didn't like dozens of songs. But here's where things started to get interesting. The experimenters sorted people into different groups just using a computer so that people could see how many people in their group downloaded certain songs. They could see that in my group, one song's getting very popular. And they could see in my group, this song doesn't seem to be attracting much interest. What the experimenters wanted to see was how influential on people's decision to download songs was the perceived popularity of the song. And the question was, would all groups converge on Taylor Swift is great, Selena Gomez is great, or would they shift in very different directions depending on which songs got initial popularity? Here's the astonishing finding. While the worst songs never were completely unpopular and where the best songs as measured by the group where people didn't see what other people liked, the best songs were never disastrous. Otherwise, anything could happen. Because it benefited from initial popularity. And then everyone said, that's great, I'm gonna download that one. And another song, which is actually a quite good song, could do very poorly, just because it didn't get initial success and people decided it must not be a good song, nobody likes it. I promised you this is about politics and democracy and not just about popular music. And now I'm going to tell you why. This is how politics works. With respect to ideas, whether they involve a certain response to COVID-19, a certain policy that would reduce inequality, a certain political candidate, a new idea about how to deal with, let's say, road safety. It's a lot, they're a lot like songs. And studies show that that's exactly how it works that if people see an idea is getting popular early, let's say wear masks, they will wear masks. If they see the same idea is initially not getting popular, meaning don't wear masks, they won't wear masks. All of us are very responsive to the social signals given by other people. And if we see that other people are driving safely, voting for a certain candidate, doing something in response to a pandemic or doing something in response to any other problem, we are going to be more likely to do it too. What I've just described for you is called an informational cascade. It's a complicated word. It's in the same family as polarization, as I described before, but an informational cascade can make societies get very divided as one society starts to like Taylor Swift, another likes Selena Gomez, 
forgive my not very good Spanish accent, as one society starts to love a idea or a politician, one group, and another group starts to despise that person. Then societies can get riven and very divided. And I can tell you in my country, the United States, we've seen informational cascades with respect to climate change, with respect to the pandemic, with respect to political candidates, which have gone in very different, different directions among very different people. And with respect to constitutional proposals, you can see exactly the same thing. If we put these pieces together, the group polarization problem, where like-minded people end up going to extremes, remember the climate change example, and informational cascades, which are occurring on Facebook and Twitter every minute of every day, we can have an understanding of why societies get sharply split and why governance is often very challenging. Albert Einstein said, if I had a serious problem and I had an hour to solve it, I'd spend 55 minutes trying to figure it out and then five minutes trying to fix it. I'm going to spend a little more than five minutes trying to fix it, but let's shift to what nations can do when they're facing these problems. Okay, the first solution I'm going to propose of the three isn't very uplifting, but it's really important. All societies need to give a large role to experts. When I worked in the White House and the US government, some of my favorite colleagues were people who I had no idea what their polit political views were. All I knew was they were experts on road safety or chemicals that were dangerous on, or on how to improve the condition of working people. That's what they had worked on for five or 10 or 20 years. They were experts. In the last 15 years, we've had a reduction of trust in experts, but often when we get clear on what the facts are, our political disagreements tend to be less interesting. If we know, for example, that some air pollutant is making a lot of people sick, we are going to want to reduce the air pollutant and it's not gonna matter terribly much who our political friends are. We don't want people to get sick. So the first point is whatever we do with a constitution or a government or a set of institutions, we ought to make sure that experts have the authority that their expertise entitles them to. The second point is checks and balances. The too often in society or in government, people are talking mostly to people who agree with them and who support them. A system of checks and balances, which can be created through formal processes or which can be just part of the life of a government organization is a great help. When the US constitution was being debated, many people said it's going to fail the reason it's going to fail is the only way to have a government is if people are like one another, that they agree. If you have a country that has diversity and disagreement in it, it's bound to fail. Now, even today, that is a view that is being voiced and it isn't crazy. Alexander Hamilton thought though it wasn't crazy, it was wrong. And indeed, Hamilton thought it was exactly the opposite of the truth. Hamilton said that the jarring of parties and differences opinion can check the excesses of the majority and promote circumspection and deliberation. Let's pause over that. What Hamilton said was differences of opinion, if they are channeled, can through the system of checks and balances, promote circumspection and deliberation and check the excesses of the majority. My father, I will report, fought in World War II against fascism and fascism 
under Hitler and Mussolini did not have checks and balances, and it did have excesses. That's a mild word. As Hamilton is right that if diverse people are able to talk to each other in a system that has checks and balances, then we can deliberate better together. My third solution grows out of something very small. And the small thing is a set of experiments done by people who are interested in making politics work better. And the experiment is called the deliberative opinion poll. And the idea behind a deliberative opinion poll, it's a little bit amusing, I think, is if you want to find out what the people of Chile think or what the people of Ireland think, don't just call them on the phone and ask them, what do you think about some issue or some candidate? Get people in a room and ask them to live, deliberate together and then conclude the poll by asking what they think after they've talked to each other. So the basic idea is that instead of ensuring that people in their own little community or their own echo chamber are answering some telephone call or answering some online poll, have diverse people actually talk to each other. In one of the deliberative opinion polls that's been conducted, things got very heated. And one person in the little group who disagreed with another person in the little group got very angry at that person and didn't talk to her for two days. At the end of the two days, he came up to that woman and things had been very unpleasant. They hadn't spoken to each other. And he said to her, what are the three most important words? She was frightened. He had gotten very angry with her. And he said with considerable emotion, the three most important words are, I was wrong. He was confessing he had learned from her and he was not correct. That's a very emotional version of the promise of the deliberative opinion poll. The less emotional version is the record is if we can find spaces where different people from different perspectives are talking to each other, listening to each other and looking one another in the eye, then some of the risks of polarization and division can be reduced and if we're lucky, eliminated. I'm just about done. The problem has two faces. First, in many cities and towns and streets and nations, we are witnessing group polarization where people who tend to think something are talking and listening mostly to one another. If that's happening, then in one location or on one website, people can end up thinking something quite extreme and another location or website, people can end up thinking something also extreme, but very different. That makes governance really difficult. It makes mutual understanding very difficult. In the worst cases, it makes society impossible to keep together. The second problem is the informational cascade. Not a lovely term, but an important term where a fact is believed by, or an opinion is shared by a group of people as it transfers from one person to another, to another, to another, to another, to the point where that idea is like Taylor Swift, really popular. Now it happens that Taylor Swift is great, but some of the supposed facts or the ideas that come from informational cascades aren't great. And that can create terrible problems for governance. In those two ideas, I suggest lies a clue to some of the challenges nations are now facing. If we want solutions, there are three directions to go. Solution number one, respect experts. If they've spent 20 years on the problem, they're not infallible but they probably know something that the rest of us can learn from. Second, cherish checks and balances. 
checks and balances are a way to overcome excess and to enable people to learn from each other. Third, use the idea of the deliberative opinion poll, not only in daily life, but also in political life. Whatever one's next week is going to involve, talk to people who think differently, learn from them, understand that at least once in the course of the month that you do that, you will agree that the three most important words we have might be, I was wrong. I'm going to end with a short passage, very short passage uh, from John Stuart Mill, a great theorist of democracy, writing very long ago and speaking quietly, but with a kind of fierceness. It is hardly possible, Mill wrote, to overstate the value in the present low state of human improvement of placing human beings in contact with persons dissimilar to themselves and with modes of thought and action different from those with which they are familiar. Such communication has always been, and is particularly in the present age, one of the primary sources of progress. Thank you.